the mind Yea, all I need in Thee To find, O Lamb of God, I come God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, He has removed your guilt forever. You are His own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to His will. Amen. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve. disciples of our Lord. In 1971, there was a Stanford professor who performed a prison experiment funded by the U.S. Office of Naval Research. And, and in this experiment, 18 volunteers, plus a few alternates, were divided into two groups. And, and some of them were inmates in this experiment, others were prison guards. And so they set up this pretend temporary jail in the basement of one of the buildings on campus. And they started the experiment, and the experiment was supposed to study the dynamics between prison guards and inmates, especially the dynamics of inmates who have been dehumanized. And, and the experiment started, but it didn't take very long for things to go off the track. After just about a day and a half, one of the guys seemed to have gone off his rocker. He had to be replaced. And then things just seemed to go from bad to worse. Uh, the people who were guards, even though they were told, all right, you can't physically hurt anyone, they ended up using psychological tools to bully and, and to push people around. And, and things were just getting so bad that after six days, the whole thing was called off, and it was canceled. Uh, and since that time, that, that experiment really has become sort of famous. 
It's included in a number of psychology textbooks. There was even a movie made about it a few years ago. And even though it's been criticized by some and absolutely dismissed by others for some poor methodology and other issues that it had with it, it, it did tend to reveal a fault with our sinful human nature. People like to grab power. People like to push people around. Our sinful human nature likes to be a bully sometimes. And that's certainly something that we can see in the history of the world. How many times have wars started because of a person's or a group of people's desire to be on top? That's what led one uh, British philosopher back in the 1800s, really a British politician, to say, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that's one reason the founders of our country tried to have in place a whole system of checks and balances so that no one person would have all the power. Now we can see that attitude, we can see that quest for personal glory and honor when we look around the world. But as we look at our scripture reading for this morning, we see that we even see it among Jesus' closest disciples. James and John, they come to Jesus. They want the position of, of power and glory. And even though Jesus doesn't uh, question their seal, he does give them a little bit of a direction and he does teach them a lesson about greatness in Christ's kingdom. Instead of focusing on their own glory or their own authority, he tells them greatness really comes from being willing to serve one another. And of course, that's a lesson we have to learn too. As we live as God's people, we want to be great in Christ's kingdom, not by striving to be on top or, or taking all the glory for ourselves, but instead by striving to serve. We strive to serve one another because Christ has served us. I'll return once again to our old, excuse me, our gospel lesson for this morning from Mark chapter 10. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, but one of us sit at your right and the other at your left of your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with, the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answer. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with, the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they were, became indignant with James and John. And Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. But not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of our Lord. Now by God's grace, it seems that James and John were part of Jesus' inner circle. I mean, uh, Peter, James, and John, those were the three whom Jesus invited to go in to Jairus' house when Jesus brought that little girl back to life. Uh, those three were the ones who Jesus brought with him up to the Mount of Transfiguration. Those three were the ones who Jesus brought with him when he went into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And there's several other examples of how Jesus gave this special grace, this special blessing to these three disciples. And perhaps that's part of the reason that James and John were bold to come to Jesus with the request that we read about in our scripture reading for this morning. And notice how, how they asked Jesus, first of all. They said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, if you had a kid who came up to you and asked you that question, all right, before you answer, whatever we're going to say, just say yes, okay? 
How would you respond to that? And it seems like the disciples were little kids asking for that. And, and, and Jesus shows his patience, even though he is the Son of God himself, and he knew what was on their minds. He says, all right, say out loud what's in your heart. And they did. And they say, Lord, we want one of us to have these two places of honor. One on our, your right and the other on your left. Now, when we think about that, that was pretty bold of the disciples to ask something like that, right? <coughs> if you back up just a little bit in the same chapter of Mark, it tells us how Jesus had already taught his disciples what was coming. He had told them, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be betrayed and to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him, and three days later he will rise. Jesus was clearly focused on how he had come into this world to be the one who would offer his life for the ransom of men. And the disciples were focused on their own glory. Or look at it another way. You know, they're thinking they want these positions on Jesus' right and his left and his kingdom, but who are they? I mean, there were a lot of other people who could apply for that position. James and John knew the Old Testament. They knew about Moses, who had led God's people out of their slavery and through their wilderness. They knew about prophets like Elijah and Elisha, who had served the Lord faithfully. They knew about King David, about whom the Lord himself said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. And, and the list could go on and on to include people like Jeremiah and Isaiah and, and so forth. And yet these two disciples came and asked Jesus, all right, we want these places of glory. Now, if you were in Jesus' shoes, how would you react? He had just been teaching them about how he would serve others. He, he had been showing kindness and compassion by healing people, by driving out demons, by taking away their sicknesses. He was trying to teach his disciples about what it meant to be a, a, a servant to God's kingdom. And, and now they're asking for that. Couldn't you easily see Jesus react to those disciples and say, what in the world are you thinking? Haven't you been listening to anything I've been seeing? Who do you think you are to come to me with a question like that? But instead of reacting that way, Jesus shows his patience once again, his kindness and compassion. And he asks them a question. He tries to get them thinking along the right lines in the right direction. Can you, can you drink the cup which I'm about to drink? Can you be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? And here once again, without really understanding the question, the, the, those two disciples answer in the affirmative, yeah, yeah. And Jesus goes on to tell them, yeah. He, they will drink that cup. They will be baptized with that baptism. And, and then that would happen. James and John would both suffer because of the gospel. In Acts chapter 2 that we read in our second lesson for this morning, James was the first of the twelve who was put to death because of his faith in his Savior. And then in the book of Revelation we read, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering of the kingdom and patient endurance that our eyes in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He would suffer. He would be exiled because of his faith, but still, at the point that they asked this question, at the point that they answered Jesus' question, they didn't really have a firm grasp on all that would be. And notice what happens when the other disciples follow that. They got upset. Now, it doesn't seem like they had a righteous anger over this. It seems that it was more likely they were jealous. Why didn't they think of it first? Who did these two disciples think they were? 
Now we can look at this and, and see the faults of those disciples and we can easily say, well, if we were in their position, we wouldn't have done the same thing. But at the same time, we have that same sinful nature who often looks for glory and honor. Are we sure that we wouldn't have tried to do the same thing? To get to the front of the line, to be the one sitting on Jesus, right or left? Or maybe think of it a different way. Jesus continues to be the eternal God who rules over all things. And as the Bible says, he does it for the good of his church. In you know, other times when we're bold to come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I know you're our Lord and Savior, but I think you got it wrong this time. You allowed this trouble or this trial into my life. You're not listening to what I'm telling you you should be doing. How often are we tempted to give the God of glory advice on how we think he should rule his universe? All too often we try to take those positions of pride, power, and authority for ourselves. But just like he does with his disciples, Jesus doesn't respond to us by saying, well, who do you think you are to be able to talk to me? Instead, Jesus responds to us with his kindness and compassion. Think of that. The eternal God takes time to listen to the prayers of sinful human beings. And, and as he does, he, he focuses our attention not so much on our own power and prestige, our own glory, but instead he turns our eyes to him. And he reminds us that being great in his kingdom is really about serving one another. Now, the disciples, they had seen how throughout history Selfish ambition had, had, had begun wars and how nations rose and fall, fell because of it. And of course, that's something that we see throughout history. That's something that also often we still see going on today. But Jesus says that true greatness comes from being able to serve one another. And that's not just something that Jesus talked about. That's not just something Jesus taught but it was something that he displayed in his life. Because that's the whole reason that the eternal God who reigns on his throne in heaven left his authority behind for a time. He did it so that he could serve us. That's why Paul writes in his letter to the Philippians, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Jesus set his throne aside for a time to benefit us. And in this work of serving us, he really came into this world to put himself in our place. And that means not only did Jesus take on human flesh and blood so that he could be our brother, but he came into this world and he put himself under God's law for us. Even though Jesus, the eternal God who doesn't need to answer to anyone, he willingly obeyed God's commandments better than we ever could. And not only did he do it to give us an example to follow, but he did it more importantly as our substitute in our place. And that means that after he had lived that perfect life, he was willing to lay that same life down as a ransom for the sins of many. And, and that's exactly what Jesus did when he allowed himself to be arrested and, and to be beaten and to be brought to the cross. He, he, he took our place. He turned his back to the whip of the Roman guards so that we wouldn't have to. He allowed that crown of thorns to be pounded into his head so that he could be convicted as a king of sinners. He allowed himself to be nailed to the cross and be suspended between heaven and earth so that he could shield us from the righteous judgment of a righteous God. He did all that so that he could serve us and offer his life as a ransom for many. But now that that work has been completed, now that Jesus has proved his victory by rising from the dead, the same one who came into this world to be our servant 
has become the greatest. He is our king. That's why we continue to read in Philippians. Jesus Christ became obedient to death, even death on the cross. And therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth. Because Jesus was willing to drink his cup of suffering for us to be baptized with what we might call a baptism of blood. He has become the greatest and now he can rules as our eternal king. And, and as the one who showed us what it means to be willing and ready to serve, Christ now asks us to reflect that same attitude as we serve our fellow believers, as we serve the world around us. And because we know how much Christ has done for us, how can we do anything else but willingly say yes, Lord? As Paul writes, Christ's love compels us. And so everything we do, we do to give glory to God's name. Everything we do, we do to point people back to Jesus, our Savior, so that we can show how he has served not only us, but the entire world. Everything we do, we do to reflect that heart and love that Christ has displayed through his word. And so may we strive to be the greatest in God's kingdom. Not by asking for power, glory, authority for ourselves, but may we strive to be the greatest by rejoicing in the service that Christ has offered to us and striving to serve one another. Amen. Now may this grace of God which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, at this time speak with bravest fire and have the gift to all inspire but have not love my words are vain as sounding brass and hopeless gain And striving so, my love profess, but not be given by love within the prophet soon turn strangely thin.